a good day um, to grade 12s. Um, we are going to do a touch up of paper three, English home language revision. We just need to put in place everything that we're expecting from you on Monday. Before I even start the session, a good luck to all of you. You have come so far. Uh, may the journey starting on Monday be very fruitful for you. And um, we hope you pass all your exams, not just English home language, all your examinations to pave a proper way for your higher education um, year next year at Varsities. Right, we are starting our exams with English home language paper three. And that is what we're going to touch on today, which is the essay writing and the transactionals. We're just going to put reminders in place and expectations of what we want you to do. It's a three-hour paper. We all know that by now. And I believe the best way that we can advise you is not to take any shortcuts or rush the process. It is a process writing paper. And I believe that's one of the reasons why it's elongated in terms of um, uh, time frame. But we hopefully are looking forward to the processes all being in place and time management having been practiced properly so that you can be able to do the right thing. That is the highest allocation paper on your SSMs. So we're expecting that it will make a dent in your 75%. Uh, so please, um, let's make sure with this paper three, you are writing it first, unlike at the end of the exams when you are exhausted and drained. So which means you will have the energy, you will have the creative juices flowing when you write the paper. Please be uh, aware that relevance is important. Choice is important. Whatever you choose, please make sure that it becomes relevant. Uh, and therefore, you can be able to do justice to the essay. All right, without any further ado, let's go to the structure of the essay. We definitely have three things that we expect in the structure. We have our introduction. The key word in the introduction, it should catch the reader's attention. Please, let's be captivating when it comes to the introductions. Be very striking. Entice the reader to continue reading. That is your hook for the marker to continue marking you and to give you what you need uh, no. as a mark. So please, whatever we do in the introduction, uh, let's do away with this essay. We'll do this and that. Please, rhetorical questions. Put a rhetorical question if you must to catch the reader's attention and involve them so that they can be part of um, your introduction as much as possible. I believe we've come so far now. We've looked at so many comprehension passages. I always tell my learners that please use what you do in comprehension passages to build ideas of how to um, build on your introduction and your content so that you can be able to uh, have a catchy and relevant introduction to an essay. Um, one of the things that we also expect is that uh, always um, it should have, uh, it should be short. Don't go long in the introduction. Please go short and make sure that you are able to Captivate a, a grabbing attention, grabbing statements is what we expect. A quotation, um, a statement, a rhetorical question. Those are things that we expect you to give to us as a catchy uh, tool for you to have a beautiful introduction. You definitely have a body. This is the full content of an essay where you exhaust all your ideas. Avoid redundancy, please. We have a tendency of redundancy. The only reason you'll be redundant in your content is because you chose the wrong topic and therefore you don't have much to say anymore. So that's why I will advise you to make sure that choose your topic wisely. Make sure that you are able to have enough content. Your planning must be exhaustive enough for you to say, I will not be repeating myself. I have this and this and this to touch on. I push my learners to go eight points in the in the planning phase to say you have enough points so that you don't have to meander around the same issue over and over. So please do not avoid the planning phase as much as possible as it will help you to jot down your ideas and be able to know how your what stands out. 
The body must be divided into paragraphs, each of which must have a main idea with supporting topics. Please, paragraphing must be done right. We are pleading with you. You have a tendency of making elongated paragraphs so long that it becomes so exhaustive to mark. Please make sure you divide your work into tangible paragraphs so that you can be able to now have the marker breathing properly when reading. Please make sure you punch away to your sentences in your paragraphs and not just be having complex sentences, compound complex sentences. Vary your sentences, simple, compound, complex. Please make sure you have a main idea and then that's when you can expand on it with your supporting details. Seven to eight lines, that's normal paragraphing, guys. So please, let's make sure we do right and not be going too much with the creativity and now writing a paragraph of 12 lines 13 lines 14 lines as we usually get it is not a summary remember it is just a paragraph you are still going to have other paragraphs in your body so let's make sure we divide our content properly your conclusion, just as you did with the introduction, it was short, it was catchy, it was striking. The conclusion must be short as it is rounding off your essay. You don't have to repeat yourself in your conclusion. Just round it off. Put a statement, a bold statement across that shuts down the whole argument or that lays the, the, the issue to rest if you must. But in a short, uh, uh, what is this, um, way that is able to close off everything. So don't repeat anything because you don't have to emphasize on anything. What you simply need to do is to round it off and then you'll be done. All right, let's move on. Steps to writing an essay. This is the process writing we're talking about. We definitely must plan. Uh, as I said, I'll repeat myself. I had to push my learners to go eight points with the brainstorming and planning. They have to put them down. It's a pre-writing phrase, guys. It's not written after the essay. It is written before the essay because that is where you can actually realize that you left something out and then you can be able to now add on as you are going on. Brainstorming is just points. Remember, others use uh, clouds, others use a, a, a flow chart, others use just a, a listing a, a format of points, others use, uh, uh, what is this one, a um, a round circle thing or diagram, whatever they use. It doesn't matter what format it comes in. What matters is that your ideas are clear in the planning. To say you'll touch on context of something, you will touch on the issue of this, you will touch on ideas of how to combat something, you will touch on uh, advice given. You must be able to make sure that in your essay you do all those things that are supposed to be done according to the types of essays as we're going to go down now. Please, my maps, key words must be clear. So as a result, if your planning is in place, it means you will not struggle with the whole essay because drafting now is just putting your mind map into flesh and giving it a proper context. Drafting is, remember, is when you are quickly writing your essay, but then mistakes are norm and therefore it means that you will make mistakes. But you must be able to be creating a story out of your ideas when you're drafting and therefore that's when now you must edit it. When you edit it, that's when you check your language. That's when you your spellings, your construction and everything that is supposed to be done. And then that's when now finally you have your final copy of your product. So let's make sure that we plan, we draft, we revise our draft, we edit our draft, and then we now write and publish our final essay. We said it's a process writing. It is a 50 mark question, just one question, 50 marks, which is very demanding. Let's look at the five types of essays. I advise that you choose your essay topic based on the type of essay you want to make it. I will repeat myself. Please let's choose the essay topic based on the type of essay that you want to make of it. So when you are taking a question and saying, this is question number one, this can be a narrative. That's what you do first. This can be a narrative. This can be a descriptive. This can be an argumentative. It means that you'll be able to say, but I can do very well in a descriptive essay. I'm not sure about a narration, so let me leave it and make this question a descriptive. That's how you write your essay. Then you know very well what type of essay you're supposed to produce. So don't just choose an essay based on the 
uh, uh, sounding of words for you to say this sounds fine for me or this sounds better. I don't know better than what because you are supposed to make sure you make sense of the question and what type of essay it's supposed to come out as. Our types of essays will go quickly. It's narrative. It's um, um, a descriptive essay. Uh, it's a... Our next one is uh, a reflective essay. So you choose your topic based on what type of essay, a discursive essay, and then you have your um, argumentative essay. So decide what type of essay you want to make of it, which will make it easier for you. And then we finally have our interpretation of visual stimuli text, which are the pictures that you are given as questions. Those are the type of essays that we're going to look at today as we see, but we're going to go back a little and talk about this and see how we make of it, because I think we need to just revise the tenets of what we call a narrative essay, a Descriptive is a relative uh, um, argumentative essay so that we can be able to put our thoughts in place to say what exactly are we expected to do in these essays. It doesn't matter what type of essay you choose. What matters is do you know what's supposed to be done in that type of essay? You'll be fine if you decide on it that way. Uh, our first type of essay is um, a narrative essay. It tells a story or tells of a past event. It does not have to be true, really, or based on a true event or on your own life or experience. So it can be written in any perspective. Remember, it's creativity. So as a result, it can be a past event based on something that you you read somewhere, something that you had somewhere, and then you put some flesh into it. So Ideas are coming from various sources, something that we, we saw in our past, something that we came across in our past, experiences that we've even read about. So those are the things that we're talking about. Features of a narrative is uh, we watch TV a lot. So those are some of the things, but please don't make it unrealistic. It must be realistic. The essay must have a very strong storyline and be very convincing if it is fiction. Who is your protagonist main character? What are the protagonist's intention? So as a result, you must paint a picture and a narration about your protagonist. What are the events that set your story into motion? Which means there must be a sequence of events and the development of the events must be very clear. What is the unexpected challenge or obstacle that now prevents your protagonist from achieving his or its plans? Uh, so as a result, we must be able to say... There is somewhere where there's a crossroad, and therefore it means that um, there must be a decision that must be taken. So as a result, it is in the past tense all the time. In other words, we're saying, I believe when we're coming to a narrative essay, we always talk about the issue that it takes this format. Remember, we have stages in a story. We have always the introduction. We have the, uh, we call it the exposition usually. And then you finally have your uh, development. You have your climax. You have your uh, resolution. And then finally, you have your ending. So as a result, it usually takes this format because it does follow stages and the events must be chronologically uh, are given as a way of this leads to that automatically this comes followed by this. So as a result, when we say a narrative essay, you must really be able to put a story into line in the form of that that we usually do in paper two to say a novel is usually having that. So your story must have those stages for it to be very convincing. We are introduced to this. You introduce the protagonist. You give a picture of the uh, protagonist mentally. And then you develop now and bring a storyline. And then you give the climax or the challenges or obstacles. And then finally, how overcoming those obstacles, challenges, and solving of those problems is done. And then finally, your essay will end. It is written in the past tense. Please, can we make note of that? It is written in the past tense. The introductory paragraph should capture the reader's attention. We've talked about this one during the structure. An unusually interesting ending gives the a story the final touch. I love the word unusually. Unexpected. Take the marker 
out of their comfort zone and make sure that they they even surprised how they came to this interesting ending because they were not expecting it. That's what we call a narration. You, the reader's interest who's your marker must be maintained until the end. So think about the style. Think about the rhetorical devices and action that's, that must ensure sustainable interest. We usually leave these things out. You see the styles of writing when you're doing your comprehensions. As I said, there is a relationship between your papers because we take the style of writing from paper one. We can also take the style of writing from paper two. Rhetorical devices are from paper two, which means we must be automatically able to come up with uh, 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 what we call the personifications, the similes, comparisons, the metaphors, the hyperboles. We must, the paradoxes must be able, I'm not saying use all of them. I believe three are enough. You'll get away with it. Rhetorical question there. Uh, create your own uh, a simile or metaphor somewhere there. Create some hyperbole somewhere there. And as a result, you'll be fine, dusted for the exam. So as a result, this also is one of the things that really needs diction. We've, we're doing so much diction in our poetry, and I believe you now understand that words have an impact and really make uh, a, a, a stamp in any type of writing. So these are the things that you must infuse now. We expect you to give them to us in the examination next week. So please look at words that really call out, that can be really interesting for a narrative essay. And there's, you cannot go wrong if you really do those things, you still have time. A successful narrative vividly highlights sensory details, such as sight, sound, taste, smell, and tactile, uh, tactile sensations. So when we say a successful narrative, it means that you touched all elements in the description. The the uh, the senses are awakened, and as a result, sight, what you saw, the sound, what you heard, and what it sounded like, the taste, the the smell. You don't have to use all of them, but at least have some sensory details to bring in. Remember our poem. Uh, it is a beautiful evening. So as a result, I'm just trying to bring in something that says. Touch on what you see. And as a result, when you're narrating, it can bring in a beautiful image of a sunset. So as a result, that's what you call them, a sunbeam. So there's this beautiful images that are brought up uh, of the site. So uh, these are the things that we expect you to include when you're talking of your uh, narrative essays. It often is a strong descriptive element. We have a sample which says, in the middle of the night, the thunder was screaming in a gruesome voice. The rain was pouring. Not it was raining, as usually say, but it said the rain was pouring like a waterfall. There we go. Beautiful uh, description and a simile given there onto the windowsill. As usual, I was alone scared graduation beautifully done there for parenthesis guys let's be very creative when we're writing because let's look at the diction in just two sentences three sentences we're having beautiful diction we're having a beautiful sensory detail we are having a beautiful uh uh what is this one uh uh simile we're also having a beautiful dis a parenthesis punctuation beautifully used and emotion brought in so let's not say things in a mere way. Let's make sure we creatively say them to have an impact. That is what we call creativity and writing. So as a result, let's be very careful. Let's not leave the things that we've been learning in paper one and two because they are going to be a basis of building your creativity. Write an essay of 400 to 450 words. Let's omit the limit, please, and not lie on the word count on one of the following topics. An uncomfortable truth. Broken dreams in the middle of the night. You make your own choices, guys. So as a result, try and find one way you say, which one can I bring into a beautiful narration? Is it broken dreams? Is it in the middle of the night? Or is it an uncomfortable truth? Did horror happen in the middle of the night? Broken dreams, which is loss of hope and, and 
the lack of determination to go on must be given feelings must be brought in of how people feel or how uh, that person you are narrating about felt when they could not achieve their dream go to university because of whatever transpired and therefore it means that you must bring it into a beautiful narration what started off as beautiful is now developed into something which creates a sense of uh, uh, something going wrong and then climax is the actual brokenness of the of the dream happening what is the incident that makes the dream now futile and then what is the ultimatum the decision that has to be made or an alternative that must come in since the person cannot achieve anything that they want it to be so many things must be brought in but it must be developed beautifully so as a result, let's make sure we choose wisely. Let's go to the descriptive essay. The descriptive essay, you are required to describe a person, memory, situation, place, experience, or any object. The essay question will guide you on this. It says, in contrast to other types of essays, the descriptive essay allows you to use many figures of speech and descriptors, adjectives, and adverbs. We fight so much in question number five to say, identify the part of speech of this world, of this word. So you must be able to know your adjectives and your adverbs and use them wisely because they are the dominant section in a descriptive essay. That's allowing you to give a vivid, memorable and powerful image of what you are describing. A mental image must be drawn. Details must be given. You can picture it. So imagine if you don't picture it, don't expect the marker to picture it because it's coming from you. See it in your mind first. And then that's when you know that the marker can also see it. Please hear it, feel it, smell it and taste it. It must seem almost real because it's a mental picture and it's a mental story that paints a picture in a person's mind. So when you say you give details, you say you yourself can picture it. You can see it in your own mind. It means that you are guaranteed that the other person will see it as well, which means the marker can be able to see it beautifully as well. But don't expect us to see what you can see. If you don't see it yourself, don't give it to the marker. You're shooting yourself down when you do that. So please, let's make sure that whatever you are writing, value it yourself first and make sure that you are ready to say yes. I'm seeing it. The marker can definitely see it as well. Don't leave the marker, guys, when you are writing. Have the marker at the back of your mind always to say, I'm doing it for my reader and my audience who is my marker. I have to make sure that this person gives me the marks. I must convince this person. I must create something vivid for this person. And therefore, it means that you're on the right track because you're not writing for yourself. You are writing for a specific audience. And that is the people marking you. Take note of the following when it comes to descriptive. Use the present or the past tense. Depending on what you, the question demands, you will decide based on the question. Select your words, which is the diction, carefully to achieve the desired effect. Use figurative language. Use sensory language as shown before. So when you are doing a mental tick of yourself, that's when you should be asking yourself, did I use the right tense? Did I use the appropriate diction? Is it convincing and emotive enough? Did I use figurative language? How many? Oh, here's one, here's one there. Did I use the, the sensory language? The sight, the sound, the taste, the touch, the smell. So the example that is coming to you is not just a smell, you know. We don't just say, what's that smell? You have to be clear to say, what's that, uh, 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 what is this one? Um, the acrid smell penetrated my nostrils as I breathed deeply. The humidity after the rain clung to my skin as I walked to my crippled car. A description has to be given. The car is old, but he doesn't call it old. He says he's crippled car. So as a result, the smell is not given as, 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 as just a smell. It's the acrid smell. When we're talking about uh, a touch, you must be able to say the velvet feel of something. Please be very clear in your senses and descriptions and sensory language because you don't just take something and just say it tasted good. 
Oh, come on, guys. You must say the smooth taste of this. You must be able to explain and give a beautiful description so that the person can almost taste it themselves. The sour taste of this. And therefore, you must be able to say uh, the a combination of bitter and sweet. You must be able to be able to give the senses properly. So you really need to put in your diction as much as possible before that. Uh, what is this one? Before the day you write. You, your sensory language will give you, you will give the reader an opportunity to engage all five senses in reading your descriptive essay. So as a result, when we say how to use um, the five senses in your writing, we have the sense of sight. The tiny red ant climbed up the broken twig. Smell, the sweet smell of freshly baked apple filled the air. The taste, one bite of the sour lemon caused my lips to pucker. Sound, the car squeaked every time I hit a bump in the rod. Touch, the sharp edge of the paper cut my finger and made it sting. Beautiful descriptions of the senses. There's, there's definitely creativity when it comes to a descriptive essay and therefore you must be able to describe the following. Activities, examples, hope, the neighbors, the season that brings out the best in me. You have to give a descriptive essay. When we're talking about a hope, you must be able now to say, when you are almost close to it and can smell it so close to you, which means so many senses will come in there. So the devastation of hearing news that will pull you down. So let's make sure that we try and bring in beautiful uh, descriptions. Okay. For each one of the above topics, the aim is to show and not tell a story as required in the nar narrative essay. It says, study the table below. It illustrates the differences. Examples of showing. Slowly walked, sounded, strolled. There are so many words that you can use. So as a result, when we say how you look at things, he glad, angrily looked at something. Longingly looked, ogled at something, couldn't stop gaping. So there are so many ways. These are just examples of you to say, broaden the horizon of your descriptions and your diction. Talking loudly, shouting, bellowing, softly talking, whispering, mumbling, sitting, hatched, resting, circled, plopped or plotted. So many words, clumsily, angrily, quickly. So those are the things that you can bring in and show uh, that you are taking them to something that is going to give them a vivid description for you. Now that you are aware of what trying is, those are examples that you can use for yourself as you are practicing in preparation, telling some help showing you'll do them on your own and try and infuse them in your revision of saying, I'm not sure how to develop my diction. So let me use this activity. So you can use them to make sure that it takes you just a few, a few minutes for you to say, let me try and put in some descriptions for myself and see if I can do that. All right. Uh, I'm going to move on to the reflective essay. In a reflective essay, the writer contemplates an idea and gives his or her emotional reactions and feelings. The writer could, for example, reflect on dreams or aspirations. It presents a set of thoughts and ideas about a topic with no particular attempt to argue for or against anything. What is a reflective essay? Analysis is done. It's an analytical piece of writing. There is a description, but it doesn't end there. The description is accompanied by the reflection of that description. Describe the facts that made up the event or the experience. Set the scene and make it clear. But you are supposed to evaluate the experience itself. So when you are going to give a description of, a, of an incident, please reflect on it. That's why we call it an analytical piece of writing. Because you will have to now... Put an objective view of exactly what transpired without any bias. Features of a reflective essay. It is personal, can be or subjective. Feelings and emotions play a major role. A substantial part of an essay may be descriptive. These descriptions should be vivid and aim to recreate the recollections of feelings expressed by the writer. The ideas... Thoughts of feelings expressed should reveal sincerity and personal involvement, usually 
on something the writer feels strongly about. When writing your essay, keep in mind that you should focus on the deeper reflection of yourself or your experience. Focus on your inner emotions rather than on the event itself. You must, you must use an appropriate tone. So when we're saying reflective, it means that you must be able to use the right tone, which will reflect the emotions that you felt. You can conclude by stating what you have learned from the experience, which is the reflection part, reflective part. The day I realized the importance of family, the day I realized the importance of a matric certificate, the day I realized the importance of self-discipline. If I could turn back the hands of time, now you will have to put in into picture what exactly my haunting past. Below follows an example of an introductory paragraph for a reflective essay. The moment of truth is the title. Everyone has that one moment which changes one's life. A moment that one wishes had never happened. A moment that one cannot avoid or escape. That is the moment of truth. So as a result, when we come in, you have just included everyone because you say it changes one's life. No one can escape or avoid it, which means you've included the marker. So as a result, let's go to the discursive essay. This is an objective essay and aims to give a balanced view of both sides of an argument. A balanced view. The writer considers various aspects of the topic under discussion and presents opposing views impartially. The writer may come to a particular conclusion at the end of the essay, but the arguments for and against must be well balanced and clearly analyzed in the course of the essay. Some creators usually call it a 50-50 essay because that's when they can differentiate between a discursive essay and an argumentative essay. They understand that when you say it's a 50-50 essay, it means you will give the benefits, you will give them um, uh, the ad disadvantages as well, but you are not going to take a side or be biased towards one side. It means you are presenting both, and as a result, you are making the marker away because you are discussing. So as a result, it means when you say balance, it means both sides will be presented in a balanced way. And as a result, you're reflecting on both sides without taking any, any one side. Be rational and objective in presenting your viewpoints. Your viewpoints should be well substantiated. Your tone should be unemotional. It means you are not taking a side. Unemotional because you are presenting both. Statistics for both must be there. 50% of people do not do this. 50% of that do not do that. Hmm. So as a result, that's when we are supposed to make sure that when we say unemotional, it means that you are able to present an objective view of both sides. And they must be both convincing without one being condescending on the other. Come to a particular conclusion at the end of the essay and make sure that you close it properly. Despite the issue that this has benefits, we cannot discard the fact that we also have uh, 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 disadvantages of it and therefore it means that we have to cope with both so this is you coming in and showing the marker that you understand that we have both and we have to manage with both we cannot do without the other and therefore you leave it in that way it means you have taken a side and forced the marker to take a side giving children pocket money as a reward for hard work builds character so it means that you are bringing both issues to the party Giving children pocket money, rewarding them as a reward, it means that the child has to do something first before they can be given. It means the child will understand that uh, uh, hard work pays off and therefore character is built to say be disciplined enough to have an idea that for you to get something, you must do something first. So you are discussing. Your future is not created by others but by yourself. There are two sides to there. Parents do create our future, but on the other hand, you, you yourself must take a role in actually coming up with your own future plans and working on building your future plans. So you are not taking a side. Freedom of choice has both advantages and disadvantages. So we are talking about the issue of advantages for freedom of choice, the issue of disadvantages for freedom of choice. Both of them are brought in. We are not discussing the other. And it means that we're exposing to the marker that there are two sides to the story. And as a result, we're not taking any side. 
So as a result, these are some of the things that you can use as a, a practice field or a practice ground for you to say, this is what I've done, evidence to back up my reasons, my reasons as well. You could argue that, but here's the weakness there. Pros and cons will come in, weigh all the evidence and make a conclusion. A strong finish at that. Introductory paragraph for it is because if you say, technology has improved our lives. Some people believe that technology has improved our lives, while these others believe that it has been detrimental to our livelihoods. However, it is difficult to imagine the world without it. It is a necessary evil. This person is brought into two sides. Technology's benefits and technology's uh, disadvantages to us. And as a result, both sides have been brought in. Improvement of our lives. But at the end of the day, evil because it's it has ruined our lives so he's going to present both sides so which means both will be discussed and he will not take dominance or she will not take dominance of one above the other now let's go to the other part of this one which is an argumentative essay so that we can be able to see the differences between the two because they are not the same in an argumentative essay the key is that you must have a specific opinion of viewpoint and argue to defend or motivate your position. Your opinion should be clearly throughout, should be clear throughout. This is a subjective essay in which you try to convince the reader to share your point of view. Learners call it 80, 80, uh, 20, 60, 40. But the equation is not the same because your own side, you are going to have more to say. And therefore, it means you are leaning more on your opinion and therefore you are leaning less on what is against your opinion. And therefore, that's why we now call it a subjective essay. Remember what we said. We say the discursive essay will be a 50-50. But an argumentative essay will have an imbalance of some sort because it can be a 60-40, an 80-20, a 70-30, depending on how you bring in or what you have to say and what you have to say against. What is the point of an argumentative essay? We are asked, you want to get your point across. Uh, my apologies. It says... You want to get your point across. If you want to get your point across, it means that you must be heard and you must be understood. So when we say um, you must be heard, it means that you are saying that you want others to believe in what you have to say. An argumentative essay does the same thing. Try to convince the reader of your point of view. Um, it says... An argumentative essay is subjective and strong opinions are expressed. The essay should start with your view of the topic in an original and striking way. You should focus on points for or against the statement. You should give a range of arguments to support and substantiate your view. You should use a variety of rhetorical devices and persuasive techniques. Use emotive language in a polite manner, it says. Your conclusion should be strong, clear, and convincing. It does have an introduction. It does have a body. So as a result, arguments supporting your stance must be given. Argument one, supported by evidence. Argument two, supported by evidence, and so on. Arguments opposing your stance should also come in. Argument one, by evidence, refute this argument refute this argument for your whatever you must be doing so that you can also conclude properly so as a result this is what we're talking about when we say um an argumentative essay will not be the same and such let's go on now to here most teenagers today do not pay much attention to leading a healthy life do you agree Teenagers are influenced more by their friends than by their parents. Do you agree? Life is what happens when you sit around and mourn. So which means that you have to agree or disagree. So as a result, you must choose a side. Which one are you agreeing with? Which one are you disagreeing with? So you must be able to um, be able to come across and tell us exactly which one you, um, you are for. 
in order to thrive in this competitive world, it is necessary to appreciate the value of constructive criticism. People who cannot accept con constructive criticism are unable to succeed. They do not get along well with other people and usually become defensive, blaming others for their mistakes. Oh, wow. Interpretation of visual stimuli is our next one. Remember, those are the 6.1, 7.1, 7.2, 6.2, 6.3 that are based on pictures. So it says... Um, it's a picture or an illustration that asks you to write an essay based on what you see and the emotions that, be, that may be evoked. The purpose of the visual stimulus is to get your creative mind working. Your essay can be written in any style. You decide what you make of that visual stimuli. Do you make it a narrative? Do you make it an argumentative? Do you make it a discursive or a reflective or a variety thereof? So you decide there. When responding to an essay with a visual, ask yourself the following questions. What can you see in the images provided? What stands out in the image? What is the focus or main idea of the image? What thoughts come to mind? What feelings, emotions are evoked? Provide a suitable title for your essay. You have to provide the title yourself, which means you make up your own essay based on what you have decided is the main focus or idea of the image. It is advisable not to merely describe the image visual as a literal response to the essay. There must be a link between your content and the image visual stimuli. Remember to use the writing process as a guideline when preparing and presenting your response. The pictures reproduced below may evoke a reaction or feeling in you or stay your imagination. Choose. We have uh, uh, a female who's carrying a child and they're in the middle of nowhere. As we can see, the wide span of land. So you can decide what you want to make of the essay yourself. 2021, a new year coming from 2020. So you, that's the COVID times, I believe. And therefore now, when we were coming in, what did you experience? So as a result, what was being thrown away? Vaccine, COVID-19, challenges that we face there. So there are a lot of things that you can use now to create essays. Responding to essay questions, this can be in now your top questions because sometimes we have quotations, we have proverbs. So if a question is based on a quotation or is a quotation rather, if a question is a quotation or a proverb, it means that you must be able now to create an essay based on that quotation or proverb. This refers to a phrase or short piece of writing taken from a longer work of literature, poetry, or what someone else has said. Creative writing quotations from famous writers, leaders, or well-known people can provide the stimulus for writing a creative essay. Proverbs are also used as writing prompts. A proverb is a simple, concrete, traditional saying that expresses a perceived truth based uh, on uncommon sense or experience. They are usually often metaphorical and figurative. So do not take it literally. It means there must be a meaning behind it. And therefore your essay must be based on a figurative level. So as a result, there must be a link between the quotation and the content of the written essay. They can give you an extract from poems, novels, articles. There's, they, they've actually given us, a, I believe they gave us a, a cartoon frame I think a cartoon piece where that had four frames and then an essay was supposed to be created out of that cartoon. A lot of new things are being brought in that are relevant to us and that we're doing on a daily basis. So don't be shocked about anything that comes in there. It says when analyzing a quotation or proverb, you must consider the following. Pay attention to the main idea of the quotation. Reflect on what you think the quotation is about. Decide on the type of essay you can write linking with the quotation provided. Can I make it a discursive essay? Can I make it an argumentative essay? Can I make it a, a, a narrative essay or a discursive, a, a, a descriptive essay? If you do not understand the quotation, please leave it alone. You will be wasting your time. There are so many questions you can choose from, so don't force the issue.
Your essay should be based on the quotation, but not on the author itself. Maya Angelou, we all know Maya Angelou, Martin Luther King. But we're not talking about Maya Angelou or Martin Luther King. We're just talking about the quotation of what is there. So as a result, that's why I'm saying it is only impossible until it's done. I believe the metaphorical meaning of this quotation is that um, unless you work hard to produce something, you will not believe it until you finally achieve. Achievement is through hard work. No bed soars too high if he soars with his own wings. Make sure you fit in where you're supposed to. Do. Don't put, uh, what is this, high expectations Make sure you 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 do things that are within your capabilities so that you can be able to uh, 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 excel and actually perform. Some of you say joy is greater than sorrow and others say nay, sorrow is the greater. But I say unto you, they are inseparable. Together they come and when one sits alone with you at your board, remember that the other one is asleep upon your bed. So in other words, we're saying sorrow is a product of joy that is not uh, uh, sought after so at the end of the day it means that they are related there's a relationship between the two so you must be able to take a figurative meaning of the quotation and then you'll be able to make an essay of it for example 3.651 is a beautiful discursive essay it's a beautiful reflective essay as well. So you can make a decision there and say, I'm making it a discursive. I'm making it a reflective. And that's when you can decide. That is what we call our essay writing. 400 and to 450 words is your limit. So let's please paragraph properly. There are things that we need to make sure we put in place. Let me just highlight them so that we're able to touch on them and you, you try and make sure that you solve them. Punctuation. Let's vary punctuation, please. It can't be full stop, full stop. We have so many things that we can use. Please, paragraphing must be normal. Paragraphs, normal and sizable. So don't make them too long, please. Please. And I believe we're also going to talk about, uh, what is this one? Infusion of rhetorical devices. Various, please, not just one type. Uh, and also, please, let's talk about diction. Talk about being convincing. Let's make sure we do the right thing there. We must be able to bring in relevance of topic as well is needed there. Let's be very relevant. Let's be very relevant. I always make a joke in my learner's life about it when I say, we are so tired of the ghost in the forest, the ghost in the closet. Give us also relevant uh, content that touches on us and touches on you as well, because we're both humans. But if you're going to give me a shallow description of there was a ghost in the closet and then you can't even describe, then it means you've lost the marker completely. That's our section A of our writing. Let's go to transactional writing. Transactional writing is our section B, and I believe we are here. We are on a 180 to 200 words as grade 12, and therefore it means that all transactional pieces must be done that way. We have letters, I believe. That's one thing that we are really enforcing because we have different types of letters. We have informal letters. We have formal letters. So as a result, you must be able to differentiate what makes it a, a formal letter. Audience, who are you writing to? If you don't know the person, it means it's a formal letter. So if you know the person, then it means it's an informal letter. Your audience is key. When you read the question, ask yourself, who's the audience that I'm writing to? That will determine for you to say what type of language and tone and register must I use? Your language and tone should be informal if you're writing to a person that you know, but your language and, and tone must be formal and polite when you are writing to a person that you do not know at all. So keep in touch with someone you know or are related to, or that's what we mean by informal. Give information, inquire about things, gossip, family matter, sharing news, congratulations, sympathies, which means that's where we say the purpose is informal. But if you're applying for a job, you're giving your views on an issue of, con of concern to you, you're complaining, you're requesting information, then it's formal writing. 
you must include only your address and the date for an informal letter but you must include both your addresses and the addresses of the recipient as well as the date the salutations now is what confuses most learners lately and therefore we've been trying to solve that i believe since we opened because we're trying to smooth in paper threes salutation in a formal can be dear and uh, whatever but it's dear mrs sinlofu dear sir or madam because it's formal your letter must have an introduction body and conclusion as a as a different as different paragraphs your ending if you say dear nd will be your friend your favorite niece loved her to your grandson and therefore you end off there's no surname that can be needed if you're talking to nd and so forth but if you are writing to someone you're familiar with but you're not really um uh, of the same age then it means you will include your surname it will be your sincerely and then your name and surname only without the uh, signature your salutation must be formal therefore you must include an underlined or capitalized topic line or subject line which means your uh, uh, letter must have a topic and therefore it means that you must be able to write it either in capital letters or you are going to underline it if you wrote it in small letters your ending or closing will be formal because you say dear sir or madam or dear mrs of it will be yours faithfully so as a result it if you say dear sir or madam automatically it has to be yours faithfully if you say dear mrs sinlovu automatically it will be yours sincerely you must include your signature as well as your initials and say name so let's not make those little mistakes when we're writing our letters because we need them to be in place we really need them to be in place uh the topic question will determine what the content should be uh your content must be very well structured because even if it's informal it must have a structure and must have a a a a, a, a borderline of some sort so as a result put things in a logical manner if it's if it's a formal letter so that it can strengthen your case whether you are complaining you are requesting so be straight to the point please this thing of greetings does not come in so we must be very clear in formal letter this is the features so as a result this is what we are talking about so we are expecting you to give us this and such this is what happens so this is i always encourage please can you internalize how your letter stand internalize that this must be there no this one goes there know exactly what is where so that you can be able to have a clear skeletal uh, image of your letters but let's look at it, uh, what is this one uh another informal letter i think we realize they're giving you clues there of how you can do that they are simple as a teacher has helped you overcome your fear of mathematics and wants to be able to get to you improve your marks and pass the subject with distinction write a letter thanking him or her so just use those letters please to try and make sure that you seal them in and then you'll be able to uh, put them in place uh i believe when it come to formal letters these are the things that we expect you to give dear miss smith mr smith or dsa or madam so as a result i am writing with reference to i am writing in response to get straight to the point of writing your letter the body of your letter must be containing all the relevant information and therefore it means that that's where the complaints will be brought in logically or whatever it is i look forward to hearing from you i hope you responded to your ls convenience thank you in advance for your consideration please find and close if it's an application and it's a cv so as a result please let's make sure that we do the right thing um a letter of, of request there are a lot of things that you can inquire about they just gave you a what is this one uh a sampler there so as a result they said uh we wish to go on holiday to the kruger national park in september but need more information before making a booking write a letter requesting all the necessary information you need regarding the planning of your trip state why you are writing the letter please you can inquire about the following availability of accommodation on selected dates 
costs involved, number of people to be accommodated, type of adventure packages which are very much available there, other facilities being offered you can find out so that you can be able to know. Conclude using appropriate sentences and therefore I look forward to hearing from you. So as we say it above, as a result, we have different types of, of letters. Letter of complaint, express your dissatisfaction, disappointment, don't be rude. Don't be offensive. Don't be sarcastic, please. Just state your purpose and politely state your complaint. I am particularly um, unhappy about. I am sorry to have to inform you about. Sadly, the product that I purchased recently from you, I am writing to complain about. So let's use those regular polite ways of complaining so that you can be heard. But the minute you are offensive, you will not. So as a result, those are the samplers. Know what, what you put and exactly where things go. So as a result, letter of editor to the press is the only one that does not have a dear. Let's remember that. It's strictly say or madam. So as a result, it is a letter like any normal. But please understand, we do not have the dear in our salutation. We have everything else. And as a result, we must be able to do that. And as such... That's where now we are supposed to specify the editor and then now we write the address after that in the name of the newspaper, I believe. So let's make sure that we do it right. It is a formal letter, a very formal letter. So it is everything else, but it does not have the DSA or it's only say or madam. All right. Um, there we go. That's the letter to the editor where you have your address. We start off with the editor, the name of the newspaper, the address of the newspaper, and then say or make them without the dear. And then it will be your subject line, underlined because it's in short letters. During the past month, we have experienced the following. Get straight to the point, guys. Writing this letter, bringing uh, uh, to your attention the issue that we did not have this and this from a certain period of time to that time. Consequences of these disruptions must be given. Several requests were made. You are very specific, I believe. So please, let's be very clear that we are writing for uh, uh, serious purposes and therefore we get straight to the point. So those are the things that we expect you to do. All right, those are our letters. We have so many types of letters. Please make sure that we, we understand them and then we can be able to bring them across. All right. Um, I believe I'm going to go to letter of application next. I'm going to go to the letter of application. Letter of application, I believe we're talking about um, the... Address of the sender, date, the recipient, address of the recipient, salutation, subject line. Um, all right, there's our sample. I wanted to get straight to the sample there. You have samples here, guys. Take time, look at them, and make sure that you internalize where things go. Uh, and it says um, your address, your date. The manager, the name of the firm and the address, your salutation, application for the post of the one that you are specifically applying for must be given. Let's be very specific, guys. Let's be very, very specific. Or else we are really going to have a problem if you are not specific of what you are applying for. Um, I, so and so, would like to apply for the post of specify as advertised in the name magazine newspaper website. Give details of yourself, your qualifications, make up. It says any fictionist name, please make up your, your own if not provided in the topic. Dates, the advertisement on the magazine or newspaper website appeared. Those are the things that you must give. Um, and then I believe it's mentioned characteristics, talents, special achievements, skills, experience, anything that makes you the best suitable candidate for this specific job. I hope my application will be considered favorably is your ending. Remember, we always have a one-line paragraph ending letters. Yours faithfully, you sign, and then you are done. So as a result, that's you have certain, um, what is this one there? Sometimes a CV has been called for. So as a result, these are the things that we are going to talk about. Uh, personal details, formal qualifications, 
I believe there's a caption that starts off. Owner of the CV's full name, surname and names, curriculum vitae of Java Novo. They must be listed in a consistent and orderly manner. The rest of the details give it section as subheading, personal details, formal qualifications, work experience, uh, referees, people will verify your details, must be given. They should not be your relatives or friends. It means it must be your former job, your former school, etc. So as a result, please note if they request for a CV and a covering letter, it means that they are two in one, they are combined. So which means your CV and a cover letter are assessed in combination. Both of them in English and must be 200 words. So a covering letter highlights the applicant's interest, strengths, key areas in applying for a particular position. It's shorter than an application letter. The key word is that the covering letter is shorter. So information that you put on the CV should not be included in the covering letter. Right, there's your sample of a CV. And then finally, you have your... Uh, uh your 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 cv and your letter coming in and in combination will be 200 words we are going to go to magazine and newspaper articles they are written to inform persuade or entertain style and tone of an article is determined by purpose audience and the issue being addressed school magazine will differ from that written for a local newspaper or magazine all the time guys heading must be there Style must be lively, neutral or informal. The reader must be addressed directly. It can be descriptive or figurative, appealing to the imagination of the readers. Names, places, times, positions, and any other necessary details should be included in the article. Ideas should be divided into clear paragraphs. The article should stimulate interest and keep the reader absorbed. So as a result, you have been asked to write a magazine article on bullying at schools. This article will be published in a teen magazine. The happiest days of your life by Paul Lamine, it says. School days should be a happy time in a young person's life. What can make people's lives a misery during this time The Rhetorical question brought in. In my opinion, there is one word which answers this question. I mean, a beautiful piece that can be given. So as a result, this is just a sample that you can use for you to get through something. Okay, we have the agenda and minutes of the meeting. And when we say agenda, we are saying it's a list of items that will be discussed in a meeting. So which means this is a proposal for what will be the meeting. That's the agenda. But the minutes themselves are what we call a record of matters discussed and decisions made as per items on the agenda. Features, that must be in an agenda. The word agenda must be written at the beginning as we see the sample here. I think this you have to use this uh, uh, sa these samples, guys, and make sure you put yourself in the right frame of saying, this goes there, I must do this, I must do that, you know, final revision times. The name of the meeting should be next, and I believe uh, followed by the date, time, and venue of the meeting. And then the agenda items will be listed there and you'll be done with the agenda. Short, concise, just some topics, and you are done. But the minutes themselves are more different, different because they are detailed. The name of the organization must be there as well. Short, show the dates, the place and time in which the meeting was held. State the names of the people who attended the meeting. Uh, provide the summary of what was proposed and finally agreed on. Must be in the past tense because... They were recorded during the meeting, and therefore that's why they become that issue. Um, leave out trivialities like jokes that are made during meetings. Indicate time meeting ended. Only become legal and binding once signed and dated by the chairperson after being read and adopted in the next meeting. Keep the minutes very simple. Do not include unnecessary information. Follow the numbering in accordance with the agenda. All right. So there's the sample for you. Minutes of Zinearville Secondary School Governing Body Meeting. That's a heading. The meeting was held on the 13th of, 13th of February, 2021 in the public school library, I believe, um, or in the public library boardroom at 9 a.m. Agenda items are following the agenda above 
One was opening and welcome, give details. Who gave the opening? Two was apologies. Who apologize? Attendance, attached register is there. And then I believe it's reading and adopt the adoption of minutes of previous meetings. Matters arising must be brought up. New matters, all these are following the agenda. All these that are in italics are where the agenda itself and now we're coming in and bringing in the full details. So let's make sure that we adhere to what we are supposed to do and put flesh because agenda and minutes usually come combined and there's a result. They are marked in minutes on for 180 to 200 words. So as a result, that's something that must happen as well. Okay. We have reports, formal and informal. Reports are actual accounts or summaries written in a concise manner, can be formal or informal, are requested for a specific purpose and may be either investigative or an eyewitness account. We have what we call a formal report and an informal report. Formal is an investigative report which follows procedures. An informal report is you as an eyewitness now giving details of what you witnessed. So they are not the same. So as a result, is I'm going to put the samples up because you will need to make sure, right? I believe this is what we're always trying you to internalize. It starts with this. You must be saying to, from topic, visualize it, put it in place, introduction, investigation, findings. Uh, what is this one? Uh, conclusion, recommendations, done. So guys, please make sure you internalize what comes first, what comes second. That's the only way you can get away with this now to say you cannot put anything out of place. You cannot. If you put anything out of place, please know that you are being penalized and it can cost you actually. So please, let's make sure that we know what is supposed to be where and we put it where it's supposed to be. If you do that, you will not go, not go wrong. And therefore, let's look at an informal report and you know exactly the difference. I believe this is what we need. We only have an introduction body and we have, um, I believe this is a narration. An informal report is a narration of the incident and a conclusion. Let's go back again and look at the two differences. When we say we have a formal report, it follows procedures that are an investigation, an introduction, an investigation, findings, and recommendations. But when we're coming to the informal report, we have an introduction with the body and with the conclusion and we are done. And then that's what you mean by saying formal and informal reports. Speech, my favorite, I believe, because we say them every day on a daily basis, though we don't realize that we really are. We are saying a speech is a written account of an oral address with a specific purpose in mind. The aim of writing a speech is to convince your audience to buy into your idea or pay attention to your subject of discussion. The purpose will be determined by the topic. In an examination, you, know, you might be asked to write a speech on a particular topic, or you could be asked to imagine yourself as someone else and give a speech to an audience. First person narrative is used to express your opinion. Formality is always going to depend on the audience. If you're addressing your peers, then I believe you understand it's an informal speech. If you're addressing adults and people of uh, authority, then you must be able to know it's a formal speech. So as a result, it does have an introduction, body and conclusion, not you just writing one long paragraph and saying it's a speech. So please, let's make sure that you are able to tell your audience in your introduction who you are, what you're talking about and grab their attention. Use a surprise statement from a quote or a rhetorical question to grab your audience's attention. Body, this is where you present your main points or main arguments. These make up your different paragraphs and therefore you must be able to put it accordingly. Conclusion, sum up your key points. So as a result, this is what we mean. Um, the following acronym might help you remember some of the points on what makes a great speech. P, it's, I believe it's perfect. Personal anecdotes uh, to bring your speech to life. Emotive language for E to persuade your audience. Rhetorical questions to make your audience listen. Figurative language such as metaphors and similes. Emphasis through repetition. Comparison and contrast to make your point clear. 
tone of voice that is relevant and persuasive for a specific audience. So as a result, this is what we call a speech. And um, please, let's make sure we do the right thing, guys. Know your audience. Who are you addressing? Dialogue and interview are easiest, I believe. A dialogue is a conversation between two people. It is a record of the exchanges as they occur directly from the speaker's point of view. An interview is similar to a dialogue. The major difference is that in an interview, the one speaker props the other by asking questions, whereas in a dialogue, the speaker engages in a conversation. Question and answer, I believe, is what we call an interview. So as a result, please, let's look at the format. Write the names of the characters. I'm going straight here. Casey says this, Tembi responds. Casey talks again. This is an example of a dialogue. There's a conversation. So as a result, but when we come to uh, uh, an interview, we must be able to know that there will be question and answer because the person is to ask a question, a question mark will be placed, and then a response will be given. We go to the reviews. This is an individual's response to either work of art, a film, a book, a TV program, occasion, etc., it can appear anyway, whether it's a magazine or newspaper, it says reviews are subjective as two reviewers may respond differently to what is being reviewed. Good reviewers attempt to be fair but honest. Right. Book review is what we're going to start with. Very honest, very frank opinion of the book that is substantiated by references to the text. It's a very mature and critical approach to the book. Evidence of an understanding and critical analysis of the book must be done. The story is important, but the way the story is developed and narrated is far more important. So the emphasis needs to be on the um, the way the story is developed and narrated. Um, and then finally, we have, I believe, um, use the following headlines to write your book review. You will have the title of the book, the author, the publisher, the genre, the date of first publication, Number of pages, introduction, summary of the plot, main characters, narrative or writing style, themes, overall impact of the book and recommendation. Film review still under reviews. Simply summarize the plot. Critical analysis of all major aspects must be done. Language and tone you use must match your target audience. Use the following headings, they say. Genre and plot storyline. What type of film is it? What is the film about? The setting, the cast, or the characters and portrayal. I believe we have the screenplay, and we finally have the script. So those are what we call our reviews. And as such, cinematography and lighting, editing, music, effects, comment on the director. It's very demanding. So you will decide. Restaurant review based on a place you've gone to. And as a result, menu. Uh, atmosphere, attitude, parking facilities, entertainment, open days and times, reservations if necessary, the price ranges of meals. Be very fair and balanced in your views. If you have something negative to say, make sure that you do not allow one negative point to cloud your entire experience. Be very reasonable. Restaurants are not fast food outlets, so it is unreasonable to expect food to be pre prepared and served in less than 20 minutes. Obituary, formal announcement of the passing of someone known by the audience. This one, I please beg of you, please make sure that you, you know how it stands. I believe this is the, I'm going straight to the template. Heading, name and surname of deceased, year of birth and year of death. Name and surname of deceased, age, passed away on such a date at so-and-so hospital. The cause of death was uh, a car accident or a cancer or natural causes. This is you writing it the way it is. He was born in this town, son and the daughter of, attended such a school, employed it, and worked as that. Please, he's was a member of uh, this organization or committee, RCL, enjoyed the following activities or hobbies. And then that's when you can now say positive things about the deceased. Very uh, participative when it comes to extracurricular activities. If it's a school child, very participative in community activities. Be very clear. Survived by the following. So you must be clear. Funeral service will be held at this date. 
remembered for this and that, and therefore you are done. There is no rest in peace. I will repeat, there is no rest in peace. Thank you very much. So please do not include it. Let's go to the email. The email is a transmission of messages, sharing information. And as a result, I'm going straight to the format. There can be a formal and an informal, but I'm going straight to the that, that because I need you guys to put it in. There we go. There we are. They've even told you from to tap on copy. Who wants, who has to receive your, the email, date, subjects, because BCC is optional. I didn't even go to it. It's optional. The opening, the body, the closing, and the such, if anything else, simple formats, guys. Know what comes first, what comes format, uh, what comes next, and you'll be fine. Because I think that's, I wanted a sample. This is how it stands. Look at it closely. Know what comes first. Subject is very clear. Guys, let's write transactionals and make them stand out beautifully the way they should stand. I encourage you, internalize your formats. Know what comes first. Know what comes next and know what follows. In that order, you will not get lost. There are so many activities in this booklet that you can use to plan for yourself. Do them. Go to your teacher, consult. I tried, I attempted this today. Please help me out and show me if I did the right thing. What about my diction? What about my tone? You will not go wrong. Practice will get you closer to your goal. So as a result, we've come to the end of our paper three transactionals. The questions are there. I'll repeat, please use them as much as possible. I wish you all the best in your preparation as I hope it will turn your mind around to say, I must practice this. I'm not sure of how to write an email let me do it i'm not sure if to write a report let me do it you will not go wrong practice and be ready for monday i wish you all the best in your first examination and in all the examinations that will come prepare 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 a good day to you all A good day um, to grade 12s. Um, we are going to do a touch-up of paper three, English home language revision. We just need to put in place everything that we're expecting from you on Monday. Before I even start the session, a good luck to all of you. You have come so far. Uh, may the journey starting on Monday be very fruitful for you. And... Um, we hope you pass all your exams, not just English home language, all your examinations to pave a proper way for your higher education um, year next year at Varsities. Right, we are starting our exams with English home language paper three. And that is what we're going to touch on today, which is the essay writing and the transactionals. We're just going to put reminders in place and expectations of what we want you to do. It's a three-hour paper. We all know that by now. And I believe the best way that we can advise you is not to take any shortcuts or rush the process. It is a process writing paper. And I believe that's one of the reasons why it's elongated in terms of um, uh, time frame. But we hopefully are looking forward to the processes all being in place and time management having been practiced properly so that you can be able to do the right thing. That is the highest allocation paper on your SSMs. So we're expecting that it will make a dent in your 75%. Uh, so please, um, let's make sure with this paper three, you're writing it first, unlike at the end of the exams when you're exhausted and drained. So which means you will have the energy, you will have the creative juices flowing when you write the paper. 
please be uh, aware that relevance is important. Choice is important. Whatever you choose, please make sure that it becomes relevant. Uh, and therefore, you can be able to do justice to the essay. All right. Without any further ado, let's go to the structure of the essay. We definitely have three things that we expect in the structure. We have our introduction. The key word in the introduction, it should catch the reader's attention. Please, let's be captivating when it comes to the introductions. Be very striking. Entice the reader to continue reading. That is your hook for the marker to continue marking you and to give you what you need uh, no. as a mark. So please, whatever we do in the introduction, uh, let's do away with this essay. We'll do this and that. Please, rhetorical questions. Put a rhetorical question if you must to catch the reader's attention and involve them so that they can be part of um, your introduction as much as possible. I believe we've come so far now. We've looked at so many comprehension passages. I always tell my learners that please use what you do in comprehension passages to build ideas of how to um, build on your introduction and your content so that you can be able to uh, have a catchy and relevant introduction to an essay. Um, one of the things that we also expect is that uh, always um, it should have, uh, it should be short. Don't go long in the introduction. Please go short and make sure that you are able to Captivate a, a grabbing attention grabbing statements is what we expect. A quotation, um, a statement, a rhetorical question. Those are things that we expect you to give to us as a catchy uh, tool for you to have a beautiful introduction. You definitely have a body. This is the full content of an essay where you exhaust all your ideas. Avoid redundancy, please. We have a tendency of redundancy. The only reason you'll be redundant in your content is because